I gave you of, the best guidance yesterday. So good. So good. What was that guidance? Shut up. Linux kernel 6.15, Jill. <laughs> yeah. What's so, happening in the Linux kernel? Woohoo. What a transition right there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Linus Torvalds released Linux kernel 6.15, which has so many improvements, new features, and some very important changes that I wanted to talk about here, including a new REST-based successor to the Novo open source driver for NVIDIA GPUs called Nova, which has been introduced as a foundational stub. So it's 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 going on, it's, it's starting its journey in the Linux kernel. That's and very cool, but now I'm kind of disappointed because... Aww. I'm disappointed for a, a, a reason that doesn't make sense. But the reason I'm disappointed is now that people can easily pronounce it. It's just Nova. It was yeah. Nouveau, and it's <laughs> yes. and it's, it's spelled in such a way that no one knows. How. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're losing our pretentiousness, and I feel like that is something we can't afford. Now to I can lose. no longer talk about my knowledge of Nouveau with my pinky out while I drink tea. Now, exactly. There you go. Now I'm just sipping a Coors Light, you know, slamming one back, talking about Nova, you know? It's, yeah. It's very different. It's you, get, you get it. Exactly. You get it. Oh, well, here's something I actually am really excited about. Better support for Intel Arc GPUs. And I am actually running an Intel Arc A77 here in my on my podcasting rig. So one of the things they did was... Uh, the new Intel XE graphics drivers can now report GPU and VRAM temperatures for ARC GPUs using the awesome HWMON to monitor PC hardware sensors. So now I can monitor its temps playing games and rendering. And that's something I've been able to do on NVIDIA and AMD. So it's really nice to have those temps. <laughs> yeah, it's a big yeah. deal. It's you know, a big deal. Especially yes. if you're doing any type of overclocking. But exactly. even in case you get fan failures or system issues, and you be able to monitor that stuff. So, yeah. yeah. No. Very cool. And also speaking of Intel, we had a, a talk with them at the Red Hat Summit. And they had some really cool AI tech they were showing off too. So oh, nice. I feel like this is going to be, uh, you know, it's, it's it's a nice thing to see that Intel is pushing things forward uh, because previously for the past couple of years, they haven't really been that um, forward uh, like thinking kind of thing. They've they been like took a back, hosting. You know, yeah. A little bit of a, yeah. a big hit from being kings of the mountain. But, you know, when we were talking to Intel and they, they may come on the show as well, which is pretty awesome. But when we were mm -hmm. talking to them, they, they kind of mentioned that the, the work that they're doing now and the things that they're preparing for, they're very excited about stuff coming out uh, in the future. And I think sometimes when you're king for so long, you can kind of get a little complacent. Yeah, And so complacent. it's good to have, exactly. this is what competition is all about, right? You're going to have the moment where you're at the top and then you're going to have the moment where somebody comes in and takes that from you. And then you got to get that fighting spirit back to take it back. And I feel like, Intel definitely, if they if they invoke that fighting spirit, can do something. And the reality is, the GPU market is wrecked. Mm -hmm. It is just an mm -hmm. absolute mess. Yeah. And if and, and the fact that Intel's coming out, kind of playing in the, you know, giving you 1440p gaming cards at a very inexpensive price, I think is going to work out very well for them. They're not used to being the low cost one. But that's the position they're having to take now, and I think they're doing a good job, kind of switching to that. And they've got some really exciting hardware stuff coming out, which they they hinted at a little bit while we were there. So um, I'm excited to see what comes from Intel. I'm excited as well. And I, I also think it's kind of funny because beyond uh, just the stuff that they're doing with uh, all the different tech that they're doing, but they also are a company that I would have never thought would come out with a GPU ever because it used to be a laughable idea that they would ever do one because they were just so much into the CPU market. And now that they are pushing forward GPU stuff and they're not doing it in the sense of like making it the most expensive products ever, I feel like Intel like kind of gets it now. And it's awesome to see them back into like the, the grind of getting back to where they were. Yeah. And they just, in fact, released their um, Intel Arc Pro series for workstation. And for rendering and animation. Nice. And never I never thought think, Intel would yeah. make GPUs or NVIDIA would make CPUs. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> yeah. No, it's Weird really times. awesome. <laughs> and another cool thing is that ARM and RISC V hardware support has been expanded for industrial embedded and edge devices, including um, one of my pieces, favorite pieces of hardware that I've been wanting to, to purchase, the uh, Milk 5 Jupiter. RISC-V ITX board. 
So that rolls right off the tongue. Yes. <laughs> that's very exciting. And you guys, can you believe this? There are now drivers for the Apple Touch Bar on Intel MacBook Pros and Apple M1 and M2 MacBook Pros. There you go. <laughs> that is cool. So, I, the, okay, so real quick, I get the So is this saying that there's new drivers for the Touch Bar on those older MacBooks? Correct. Or or there t- there's Touch Bar drivers for the MacBooks that don't have Touch Bars? No, there's there, ah. there support for you the just, older generation. You just start the newer touching generation. randomly on your yeah, exactly. Then, you just, just the, where the function keys would be. Like, oh, is that a is that a screen here? Or like, yeah. no, it's not. Yeah. We'll figure it out. So they got rid <laughs> of them on their newer generation, but they yeah. they they're still there. And now you can Linux on them. The new the new driver is actually really quite robust and supports. Uh, the backlight, the touch interaction, and and showing function keys and other information. And I need to remind you, this is very, very important because on those uh, laptops, uh, all the function keys are in the touch bar, which is something that we need on Linux <laughs> to do commands. <laughs> so, or just well, in general, because when they got yeah. rid of the touch bar, they brought back the function keys. So like, you know, yeah, they, yeah. They, they, see them, they see them as valuable too, but it's just like, I think there's a funny thing is <laughs> like the touch bar was so hated when it first yeah, came out. It was. And now there are people who are like, you could find videos of people are like, you know, uh, playing doom on it. <laughs> well, no, they're, they're basically making YouTube videos about how they missed the touch bar and stuff. Oh like that. yeah. Yeah. Bring it back. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I never found it particularly useful. It actually more annoyed me than anything because the, the software, and I think it was Apple leaving it up to the software developers to kind of decide what was there when you opened whatever program it was. And I think yeah. some programs did well. They put a lot yeah. of good shortcuts there. I think a lot of programs did nothing. And so you really had nothing there to, to utilize. But I like Michael's idea better. If someone can figure out how to make a non-Touch Bar Mac uh, drivers for Touch Bar work, uh, maybe if you send an electrical charge throughout the whole MacBook and then you know you disrupt it with your finger presses anywhere on the case, that could uh, enact as... That would probably cause some damage to the computer, though. Yeah, but we've got to get it working, Michael. So you got to do an EMP to your laptop in order to get the touch bar stuff to work? Sometimes you have to break things to get things working. I like you know? it. Or like a yeah. theremin style where you just have like a, you know, like the, the be able to, where, depending on where you put your hand over the laptop, that's where you have like... It affects the yeah because the electrical function. charge will be so strong that you'll start getting shocked as you get. This. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, sorry, Jill. You're trying That's to be okay. serious. Continue on. And actually, this is We're kind of kidding. a sad. It's a sad thing for me. Support for the 36 year old Intel 486 processor created in 1989, and support for the first Pentium pro- processors will be removed from the Linux kernel. You know, very few people are running the modern day Linux kernel on these old machines, except me. <laughs> and it, you know, reduces maintenance uh, overhead for the Linux kernel develop- developers and time spent on compatibility issues. And so, you know, it really does make sense. But and now- on the bright side, <laughs> you could always use 614 on the machines if, if for like a museum. Yeah. Purpose. Like if you just want to play exactly. with it, you exactly. can still do that. And, and that's yeah. what I will be doing with. What my. really depressed me is they remove support for punch cards. Like, how am I supposed yeah. to? <laughs> I mean, come on. How am I supposed to do anything now? You know, come on, t- Colonel Team. How dare you? Yeah. You know. <laughs> so now the minimum support uh, supported x86 CPU has been updated to the original Pentium or newer, which makes and sense. That makes sense. <laughs> I'm actually also yeah. bummed they got rid of support for my PDP 11. And, oh, um, well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have an older version of Debian <laughs> on on my deck alpha. So Jill's like, I got this. I've already yeah. figured it out. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. So uh, but, you know, really time marches on and I, I knew this this day was going to come. So uh, my 33 megahertz 486 DX, which I've shown off here on the show and my 66 megahertz 486 DX, too. You know, they let out a sigh, <laughs> but they'll chug along with an older Linux distro from Debian. So you guys at the Linux kernel team upset Jill. Yeah, like, <laughs> you, you should, feel, you you should feel ashamed it? of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, and there's there's also some great hardware support for gaming on Linux with Linux kernel 6.15, like they're okay, usually Okay, now is. they've redeemed themselves, making the yes. game better. Okay. Yes. Good job. For you. Um, including better support I mean, for the Sony PlayStation 5 controllers. And uh, for Xbox controllers, the Turtle Beach Recon and Stealth Ultra controllers have been added to the XPad driver, which is awesome, as well as the Power A wired controller for Xbox. And I have the Turtle Beach one, so I was happy to hear about that. <laughs> yeah, isn't the Power A controllers the one where you go into the store and you're like, there ain't no way I'm paying eighty dollars for a yeah. controller, and then you yeah. see the Turtle A one for thirty six bucks and you buy it and yeah. then you bring it home and <laughs> you realize it's like, I mean, you know, I don't. I, this is I don't know if I've ever actually done a video about this, but like I have. Uh, so as a avid gamer of a of one game, there's a thing that I've learned that different controllers are good at. And some of the manufacturing of these controllers, if you play a game for a certain amount of time or a certain amount of intensity, uh, you can cause damage to the controller just by using it. And I don't mean what Ryan does and throw it against the wall. I don't mean that. That's I the mean... way to test them. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> you just play it and you use it. And depending on how you play a game and what buttons you use, uh, I learned that the RB and LB buttons, the bumpers, are not t particularly well developed on most controllers. Uh, the Power A lasted like three months before it mm, broke. Mm. And most of the time, they last a year or two. So yeah. that is uh, just so information that I that's basically like most people will not run into using the RB button that much to break it. But it is that's possible. Michael. Well, I think that <laughs> what, what's interesting is that they make some elite controllers that uh, you can swap out the joysticks. You can replace everything in it. Of course, you pay nearly $200 for the controller to do so. Um, but that fascinates me because it should be standard in all controllers that you can just swap out those parts. Because honestly, you know, a year or two of just light gaming, you wear down buttons or you start getting drift or things just stop working right. And you, it's very difficult to replace uh, in the standard controller. The elite ones they actually make the parts for and things that you can replace. So I just, you know, it goes back to that repairability thing. We've got to get out of the mode with tech that everything's throwawayable once it stops working. Like, you should just be able to. And what's cool with the Elite controllers is it's hot swappable, almost like a Frameworks laptop where you literally just undo this bar, it pops out, and you slide the new Joy-Con, you know, joystick in, and you're ready to go. I think I just said Joy-Con meant joystick because um, that's Nintendo Switch. And they definitely don't make crap repairable because they've had drift issues forever. And uh, also, they uh -huh. have a lot of backlash right now for the Switch 2, where they're making games $90 a piece. Yeah. And people yeah. are loving that. Yeah. Well, you know, that's interesting because the new Doom Dark Ages came out. And yes. I love it. <laughs> like, I remember when my videos were really starting to pick up on Linux on my channel. One of the things that one of the videos was very popular is when I got Doom running on Linux. That was the 2000, what? 2016. 2016, yeah. 2016, yeah. 2016 version of Doom. Yeah. Um, running on Linux, you know. That and, was before kind of Proton. He's an OG, people. That's right. Yeah. This was before Proton. This was before all that. And that was a pretty popular video of mine. Um, so I was super excited for Dark Ages. In fact, the first thought I had is, I want to run it on Linux and do a video on it. But then I saw the price. And I'm like, for a single player game with a story for 80 bucks, or 120 for their special edition. I'm just, I just can't. Like, I cannot pay that can't kind of even, money. People, he can't. I even. can't even on a scale from one to even. I can't. And so that's where I was. And I feel like I'm just going to wait for it to come down in price. They're getting insane with the amount of money they want to bring in on these things. And I'm sure it's a great game. I've heard it's a great game. I just can't pay 80 bucks for a game. I just won't do it. But I can tell you, the Nintendo Two Switch is sold out, like everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I mean, apparently there's a lot is, of people with just money to burn. I feel like bar partly Nintendo knows this and they make fewer so they can just say they sold out. They know people are going to get annoyed. So they make like the, the same thing they did with the Wii, like the Wii, the Wii U, the Wii, whatever, two, I don't know, the Switch, the Switch 2. How are they always sold out? Is it because every single time they product that they make is always great? Or is it because it's designed this way? <laughs> they create like this false scarcity feeling where you're exactly. like, exactly. Oh, I better get my pre-order in or I might not get one. It still might be scarcity. It might be not false. It might be real, but they just make fewer so that they can say it. And they're like, oh, I, I have to wait 
and then they can get it and you can pre-order it and all that. Well, it comes out the new Nintendo Switch, I think the Friday this week of the week we're recording. And what's interesting about that is some people have gotten their systems early and those systems are bricked by default. All of the Nintendo 2 switches are bricked until you connect it to the internet and get the patch update. So they ship them bricked and then you you got to get this patch that happens on day one that will allow it to start working. <laughs> and that has a lot of people upset uh, as well. That's a very sketchy thing to do because that shows that their systems can do that. And that Anytime means they could do they that want. any yes, and whenever they feel like it, they could just brick it. I mean, what and, if the company hmm. was just a little bit greedy? Because we know that barely happens, but every once in a while, it was like, hey, let's just send a little signal out, and five percent of our Nintendo Switches, just as an example, are bricked, and they have to rebuy it. You know, like just a thought that that could kind of happen. <laughs> I mean, they made that just doing testing to see if people would. And you never know. Because didn't Maybe. Apple get caught? Uh, making phones slower by default so that you were forced to upgrade they would I mean, make the battery not not as uh, either not charge as fast or char- or like do a lower performance or something like that like yeah. they were and they admitted it and they admitted they were doing it it was like oh it's for protection of the battery it's the battery doesn't die you know like you could just make it replaceable apple you could make the battery replaceable and that way it wouldn't matter if it died but you know, that's no. ridiculous, Michael. We have to staple glue and solder it in place so that uh, it's the phone has a good phone feel, you know? Yeah, exactly. Except for the fact that, you know, the same time they also had the phone that you were holding it wrong. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, 